Uh, let me give you something that's more challenging than that. It's, um, it's a, um, the other version of the calculation we did on Monday. Do you guys remember on Monday, uh, let me get my props. On Monday, where we calculated the force between a uniformly charged rod and a point charge. Do you remember that? Yeah, we did on Monday. Oh, I think it was arranged this way. We did this on Monday. Um, today, we are going to flip it around a little bit. Well, we are going to flip the rod 90 degrees. So I want to figure out the force between a rod oriented this way and the charge here. Uh, let's make it easy for myself. I will just put the charge at the mid, uh, in the, along the line, connecting the, going through the midpoint of the rod. Good? So, um, so let me draw that picture here so I have something to refer to without having things in my hand. So let me call this force between uniformly charged rod and a point charge. So this is the geometry. I have a rod of length L. And let me make this easy for myself this time. Instead of giving the total charge of the rod, I'll just say it has linear charge density lambda. And hopefully you remember. By the way, lambda is a pretty standard symbol for linear charge density. So get used to it. <laughs> so the, it's defined as the total amount of charge divided by the length of the object. And it's a pretty standard symbol, so I'm not the only one using it. Um, so I have a uniformly charged rod of length L. Uh, oh, I'm not labeling the length right. Uh, of length L. And I have a charge placed in this way. Um, I have a line that's going through the middle of the rod so that you know, it's symmetric, it makes things easier for me. And at some distance, let's call it distance d from the rod, I have a point charge plus q. So the question we are asking is the same question we asked last time. What is the force on this charge plus q? Now, let me have you think about it while I erase the rest of the board. Do you have some intuitive sense what the direction of the force will be? Uh, let's say lambda is positive, just to make things simple. Lambda is positive. What should be the direction of the force? To the right? Like directly to the right or not tilted up or down? Directly to the right. So why, why do you think there should be no vertical component of force? Uniform, and one more thing. Uh, let me ask you this way. What if I place the charge instead over here? Let's say, call this plus Q2. What do you think the direction of the force on Q2 should be? Still directly to the right? Yeah. Think carefully. Downward or upward? Yeah, so uh, looking at this Q2, this is the way you would uh, analyze it. Um, so, so, you know, it's the same procedure we went through last time. The, it's hard to think about the whole rod, so you are going to think about the small sections of the rod. So from this small section here, the direction of force is directly rightward. Great. But from this small section here, the direction of force is slightly upward. And as you go to these other sections, which are farther away, so less force, but they all point slightly upward. Instead, so none of them point downward. All of them, if anything, point slightly upward. So when you add all these forces together, the net force might go this way. Good. So you know, um, the calculations we do tend to be pretty formal, as I keep saying. I'm probably going to say the word formal like five more times today. 
Um, so it becomes especially important that you spend the effort to develop your intuition. Um, th what that means is that before you do the calculation, you try to develop an uh, intuitive picture of what it should look like. And then after you finish the calculation, and you see if your calculation agrees. If it does great, if it doesn't agree, if one of two things happened. Either your intuition was wrong, or, um, or you made a mistake in your calculation. Um, um, I'll tell you that for electrostatics, most of you actually have good intuition. So most of you, so if you get something that's different from your intuition, usually it's uh, the fact that you made a mistake in the calculation. So let's go through the calculation here. So we went through this last time that we cannot use Coulomb's law directly because we run into this problem of what distance? Because when you look, are looking between a point and a segment, the distance can vary as much as this distance here, which is d, and as long as this distance here. How long is this distance? Well, it's based on half of L. So it should be square root of d squared plus L squared over 4. Everyone good with that? Yeah. Better get used to trigonometry and geometry. <laughs> it's going to come up. Um, OK, so, um, so there's a range of distances. So yeah, it's going to be a little bit tricky. Um, so let me actually put it this way. Uh, we, we, you know, we reintroduced the force as a vector so that we can deal with it as a vector. So let me draw a representative um, contribution to the force from one of these segments. By the way, I'm pretty sure the way I'm doing this is slightly different than your textbook. So uh, look at both approaches. I like the one I do better. That's why I do it. Um, but so there is something you can do called the pairwise cancellation that would help you get sort out some of the answers. But I'm going to actually do the more formal way of calculating things, because there's a, a power in the formal approach. Um, as long as you make sure to develop your intuition alongside. So um, let me just pick a representative piece here. I am going to use this piece um, as, as like an arbitrary piece along the rod. So I'm going to need a parameter to parameter, parameterize it, some position y. This is a piece at a position y. Um, and it's a piece of the size dy. That will come handy later when I need to know how much charge is in it. It will be the charge density times the dy. Okay? Now, what I need to figure out is the full vector quantity of the force. So the, what is the direction of the force due to this small segment of the rod? Sort of slightly downward, right? So it's not in any one particular, it's not you know, directly to the right. It says some um, general representative direction. So this force is what I am going to call force DF. Small contribution to the force due to this small section of the wire. Um, and everyone here knows the expression for this small contribution? Where do I get the expression from? Yeah, now I use Coulomb's law. Now that I'm talking about small section, I can treat as two point charges interacting like Coulomb's law describes. So this is going to be K times, um, let me just write out the amount of charge. Skip, save me some steps. So lambda times, lambda times dy. That's what the amount of charge is going to be, right? Okay, times. Um, the amount of charge here, plus Q or Q, uh, divided by the distance squared. Um, someone tell me the expression for the distance. What is the expression for the distance? Crystal? Okay, square root of Y squared plus D squared. Yeah, it, you are looking at, so what Crystal is looking at is this right triangle, right? And the distance is the hypotenuse. All right, so I'll write that. That's the distance. Square root of y squared plus d squared. But you know what? I'm going to be squaring it, right? So let me just get rid of the square root and say, well, that's what I'm dividing by. 
I'm not done. I need the direction of the vector. I need what I'm going to call, well, I mean, no. What we will call, we need a direction r hat. So this whole force is going to be all of this quantity times r hat. So, so you know, um, just to sort of symbolically, that's all it is. You take this expression here. Um, oh, I really didn't not plan my spaces. Well, you take this expression, df, and if you integrate it along the rod, then you should be able to get the whole force. Because, um, so you know, imagine getting contribution from small sections of the rod. This small section moves from one end of the rod to the other end of the rod to get all the contributions that will give you the force. Now, if you are doing the calculation this way, you say, you know, this is equal to, um, you know, all of this, integrate. So if you are integrating along the rod, then you are varying the parameter y. You would say y goes from uh, minus L over 2 to L over 2, k lambda times dy, q over y squared plus d squared, r hat. Um, and um, so everything here seems to be already in terms of y. So you write it out, uh, factor out all the constant quantities, k lambda q r hat times, uh, well, integral from minus L over 2 to L over 2, um, dy over y squared plus d squared. Um, and you do all of this, you get an answer, and you look up the solution in the textbook, and you'll find that your answer is wrong. What went wrong? There's a very subtle mistake made once more. <laughs> um, I'm, so the reason I'm pointing it out this way is that I mean, when I was a graduate student, I found that every time I tried to do this calculation after a few years, I would always make this mistake. So <laughs> I want you to develop an ability to spot this mistake <laughs> from early on so that when you forget all of this and try to do it again, um, you'll be able to spot your mistake again. So there's a very subtle mistake made in this uh, series of steps. There's something I've done that I actually couldn't do and shouldn't have done. Uh, dy is fine. So dy was here, dy is here, I kept it here. dy is the reminder that y is my integration variable. And also, it actually has a physical meaning. That's the infinitesimal length. Let me give you a hint. There is a um, symbol that I took outside the integral that I should not have. It actually could not be taken out of the integral. Lambda, Lambda is OK, uniform density. Wait, what were you saying? R hat, yeah. So what's wrong with the taking the r hat outside the integral? It is a relative direction, so what does that mean? So, you know, if imagine this, visualize this. As I take this, let's say I move it downward a little bit. What happens to our head? It yeah, it changes direction. What that means is this our head, it's a function of y. Yeah, um, this is the kind of thing you will begin to see when you take multivariable calculus. You will get unit vectors that are not constant. Unlike x hat, y hat, and z hat, which are constant, um, in, you know this is you know an example of a unit vector that's not a constant. It's a function of parameter. So that means yeah, I could not, I should not have taken it outside the integral because when I take it out of integral, what I'm saying is that well, that's a constant. I can take it out. Well, it's not a constant. <laughs> I can't take it out. So that's the mistake made. And so what I need to do is I have to do a more careful job of expressing this r hat, express it in terms of the constant uh, unit vectors. So what I really need to do is I need to go through this step. Say that r hat is equal to something times x hat 
plus something times y hat. Oh, darn. That means I need to define my axis. Let me define it the normal way, x and y. I mean, let's not be creative here. Um, so that's my axis. And I have to express r hat in terms of these two constant unit vectors. The, the parameters that go here are going to be the, um, the how it's a function of y. So, you know, it's an exercise that you need to go through. Um, I'm just going to stare at this for a while. So, you know, I'm looking at this here. Let me draw it a little bit bigger so I can think a, a little bit better. So I'm trying to think, all right, so I want to express this as something like this, this vector here, this vector here, and this will be my x and y component, right? And these are really x and y component. Right? So if I knew this angle somehow, then I could express this. Yeah, wait, I know this angle here. This angle here is this angle here, right? So, uh, so yeah, so I could say it's, uh, you know, cos, yeah, cosine of theta and sine theta, but that wouldn't quite work for our purposes because I really want it as a function of y, not theta. So that's why I have to go through this step. This theta can be expressed as a function of y. So looking at this triangle here, let me draw the triangle also. It looks like this, theta y d. So what I have is cosine of theta. By staring at this triangle, I can rewrite it in terms of y constant d and this hypotenuse, which will be square root of y squared plus d squared. So what's cosine of theta? D, not just the d, but d over something. I mean, this is your right triangle. What is cosine? Yeah, yeah. d divided by the hypotenuse. d over square root of uh, y squared plus d squared. Uh, what about the y component? Or sine of theta? y over square root of y squared plus d squared. Good. Any questions? All this seems OK? By the way, this technique is a technique called uh, drawing the triangle. It uh, used to essentially um, um, rewrite expressions in terms of you know trigonometric function of an angle in terms of the other parameters that you are given. How many people have seen this technique before? I feel like the first time I learned this was like somewhere in trigonometry. If you haven't seen this before, this is a pretty common thing that comes up from time to time in physics, where you know you have some that something that's potentially complicated function of theta. Well, you draw the triangles and you realize the re trigonometric relationships, then you can write down something that's simpler than what you would do if you are going through arc, arc sine, arc cosine. Good. All right, so I have that. So I had to plug this in for here. Um, do I want to write it in? Um, yeah, I guess I kind of have to. All right, so this time, let me factor out the things that are actually constant and I will write out the rest. So it'll be, factor out the things that are actually constant, that's k, that's literally constant, times lambda, it's constant because it's uniform density, times q, because it's only a point charge, and think that's it. So the rest is integral of, now it's going to have two terms. It's going to have the term containing x hat, and the term containing y hat. So let's just write it out. It's, uh, uh, oh, can I? No, I can factor out this, all right. So d times dy over, um, so this can actually combine with this to make a slightly simpler expression, y squared plus d squared, power of 3 halves uh, times x hat. Everyone good? Uh, let me write down the second thing. Let me write it this way to make it clear to factor that. Plus integral of this thing, 
y times dy over y squared plus d squared raised to the power of 3 halves times y hat. Let me fill in all the details that I've been skipping, so I like to be a little bit fastidious about this sort of thing. y goes from minus l over 2 to plus l over 2. y goes from minus l over 2 plus l over 2. Um, and close the <laughs> parenthesis. When you see all of that, I hope uh, some of you realize that something simplifies right away. Something just cancels out, goes to zero. Anybody see what goes to zero? You have two integrals. One of them is zero. Which one? Do you guys remember the whole even odd uh, integrand when you are integrating over an even interval? Yes? OK, so here, this is an even integrand. Fine. This, can you, are you guys convinced that this is an odd integrand? Y over all of this. Odd? Right? Because you know, the denominator is even. So numerators are odd, so they must be odd overall. What do you get if you integrate an odd function over an even interval, as in you are going over a symmetric interval, from a minus something to positive the same quantity? Zero. Area under the curve cancels out area over the curve. Right? Yeah? How did you know that the y is odd? So it's uh, so this is a bit, bit from calculus. So imagine sketching y. So in the x y plane. So not x. Yeah, I guess. No, y function of y plane. <laughs> so this function of y is just a line, right? This is f of y is equal to y. Um, this is we call this odd because when you flip it over the um, because when we say something is odd, formally this is what we mean. Uh, f of minus y is equal to minus of f of y. When we call something even, this is what we mean. f of minus y is equal to, well, it's just equal to f of y. It's the, this is the of uh, words describing symmetry of a function. Does this ring bells for everyone? Yes? You guys cover this in calculus? Calculus 1, hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so it's geometrically what this means is that you, know, you flip it over the axis, and then you kind of have to flip it over the, the horizontal axis again to get the same thing back, or something like that. Or if the even one, it has mirror symmetry. If you flip it over, it looks the same. Like, uh, so an example of even function would be f of y is equal to y squared. So, um, so this is an odd function. So this is an odd function over symmetric interval. So it's zero. We don't have to do anything. You can actually do the integral. It turns out this is the doable integral. You can do the u substitution here and actually do the integral. And when you do it, you'll find out that it's zero. <laughs> so I wanted to save just some of that work. Um, anybody here know how to do this integral? Any suggestions? Uh, try it in your head. If you try to substitute, u equals y squared plus d squared, what do you get? Does it work? You have to use trick substitution. So u substitution will not work. You have to do trick substitution. And I'll just uh, fast up and say this. I will never give you an integral problem where you have to use trick substitution in this class. <laughs> so instead, for these few problems where I kind of have to in lecture, I'm just going to use Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> it's easier. So I'm going to integrate 
So what I want is integral of 1 over uh, x squared plus um, d squared, kind of. Uh, maybe I should say this. y squared plus d squared. Uh, let me actually do the full length, go the full length and d. And actually, there's more. There's three halves here. So let me put in the three halves. Three halves uh, with respect to y. Wolfram Alpha has a level of uh, natural language processing. So you know, when you process it and tells you this is how it understood you, make sure it understood you correctly, then all right, that's my answer. Doesn't look all that difficult. <laughs> but uh, it requires a trick substitution, which is why I'm not actually doing it. I'm just uh, looking it up. Um, by the way, in a calculus class, you actually would have, um, unless it, you are in the trick substitution chapter of the book, you would have looked it up in an integral table. That's what I'm essentially doing here, except easier. So all this integral comes down to this. It's equal to, uh, this constant is still there, KLQ. I have the antiderivative of the uh, x hat, x hat times the antiderivative of this, uh, which is y over d times the square root of d squared plus y squared, evaluated from y equals minus l over 2 to y equals l over 2. So. Um, Oh, we got something that we were intuitively guessing before. What were you guys saying about the direction of the force here? They should be to the right, right? Well, what's the implication of this whole thing being zero? Yeah, they should, don't have any y component. So you know, this should, when you see this, that should be encouraging that the y component canceled out, that the only thing remaining is the x component. So now, if you want the actual answer of what the force is, then you would evaluate it. Let me just copy it down here. So when you plug in this, um, I guess it's L over 2 here, minus, minus L over 2. The denominator is the same either way. So it's going to be two times um, one of these plugged in. So when you calculate the force, so the Actual, oh, I, let me use the right color. Don't think I've used the purple for force yet. So when you find the right force, so force pointing this way, this force is equal to um, k lambda q times l from l over 2 times 2, l divided by, well, let me erase this, um, divided by all of that d plus, uh, not d, um, d times the square root of d squared plus l over to plug it in. So l squared over 4. Um, all pointing in the x direction. Yep. So this is a long calculation, but I think this is doable if somebody told you, gave you this out of a table of integrals. <laughs> so, all right, I've been talking for a long time. Let's take a short break. Uh, uh, let's come back at 2.20. And when we come back, I'll have about 30 minutes to uh, introduce uh, some conceptual idea that we'll be re referring to a lot throughout the whole semester. And um, that's, you know, electric field. I will sort of try to motivate why we introduce electric field. And um, I'll go from there. <laughs>